I look how you want to look and I fuck how you want to fuck. Raise your hand if you watched Fight Club and you thought Brad Pitt was the coolest man alive when you saw that little clip. I'm speaking from first-hand experience. I can absolutely tell you that I did. This video, I'm gonna break down my experience and my journey of trying to recreate Brad Pitt's iconic Tyler Durden body. But, we've, but before we do that, let's take a deep dive and let's try and understand just why Brad Pitt's Fight Club physique is one of the most iconic things we've ever seen in film. Let's start off with the basics. Fight Club is an incredible film. For me, it is the best film ever made, hands down. And I struggle to think of a film that I've watched that's really come that close. So I think just because of the nature of the film and how highly rated it is, he will always be an iconic character and everything that he had in that film will also be iconic. But I think the other thing to say too, if you cast your mind back to the late 90s and the very early 2000s, there wasn't really a lot of aspirational physiques in films. There were some, but it wasn't like it is now where you have Marvel action films, DC characters and whatever else. Brad Pitt really was the first time that we watched a film and we saw what you'd think of as a really ripped physique on screen. And I think for a lot of people that made a mark because it was really the first time they'd seen it, but also the first time they'd seen it as being something that they could possibly have. The other reason too, let's think about the concept of fandom. So fandom is the idea that we become fans of people when we see them as representing ourselves in the best possible version that we could be. Or when we see someone as having characteristics that we would like to have and we believe that we could possibly embody. From a physical perspective, Brad Pitt is about average height, that kind of 5'10", 5'11 height. And the Brad Pitt Fight Club physique is not actually massive, it's actually fairly small. And I think it's actually really noteworthy that for a lot of people, the Brad Pitt Fight Club physique is actually something that's become a little bit of a meme and something that's fairly often poked fun at by guys that are a little bit more extreme into fitness, wondering why there's so many new guys coming in that want to look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club. So I think for that reason, for a lot of guys, it does actually feel obtainable and it does actually feel like something that they could have. That was certainly how I felt when I decided that it was the physique that I wanted to have. I watched Fight Club when I was about 13 or 14 years old and I just remember seeing it. That moment when he's sitting opposite Edward Norton, you look at him and you just think, my God, this is potentially the coolest man I've ever seen. And I wanna be that, I wanna be exactly like that. So in this video, I'm gonna discuss my journey that really I had, which was very negative, and the journey that I had in order to really to try and recreate the classic Brad Pitt body. In this video, I'm gonna break down my experience of trying to have the iconic Tyler Durden physique. Little spoiler now, it wasn't filled with happiness. Instead, it was filled with anorexia, orthorexia, a lot of body image issues, and a lot of physical side effects. The year is 2014, and this picture on screen now is exactly what I look like. I'm weighing about 170 pounds, and being honest, I actually feel pretty sad when I look at that photo. Not because it was a particularly bad time in my life, but because I don't think I actually really appreciated that I was in pretty decent shape. And this links really heavily in with something called negativity bias. And negativity bias really just means that we are essentially living our lives listening out for negativity. And from an evolutionary perspective, this makes a lot of sense. We're trying to keep ourselves safe. We're trying to make sure that there's no threat around or we're potentially trying to identify threats before they can come. But for the average person, negativity bias really just manifests in only hearing the criticism and not actually hearing the positive. So when I look at that picture, I don't remember feeling bad about myself, but I think I was a lot harder on myself than I, need, than I actually needed to be. I also feel sad as well too. Around about that time, that was probably the best my relationship with food, working out and my own body image had been. I didn't have anything going on that really stopped me having a good social life. You, you know, I could go out with my friends, I could go for drinks with my friends and I could happily just work out without really having too much expectation around it. Unfortunately, as I discussed during this video, that really changed quite dramatically and it actually shifted a lot away from that. But round about the time of this picture, I felt pretty good. So when you first start dieting, the first part is usually the easiest, namely because it's the point where you've got the most amount of weight to lose, so it's easiest for your body to lose it. But also you're at your most motivated and you're also beginning to see changes in the mirror. And those changes normally become pretty visible within about four to six weeks. So you really get that instant gratification that you need to stay motivated with something. What usually tends to happen, the longer you're on a diet, the harder it gets, just because you've got less fat to lose, so your body is much less inclined to give it up. That was exactly my experience. The first kind of 14 to 28 pounds came off really easily. I felt better, my face began to chisel out, 
and I didn't really lose any strength when I was in the gym. So it felt like everything was going really, really well. I do remember when I'd probably lost around 20 pounds, a couple of people were asking if I was okay. A couple of people were saying, you should probably stop there, mate. You don't need to lose that much weight. But that was really the only thing that I was seeing. So time progressed a little bit more and I knocked off another 10 to 15 pounds. Those 10 to 15 pounds were a little bit harder than the previous, but still not that difficult. I began to do a lot of cardio and I began to really track my calories, but those were all things that felt like they were a part of my lifestyle and not things that were massively destroying my lifestyle at that point. I was probably doing round cardio around about three or four times a week and I was probably eating a fairly healthy amount of food, but probably a little bit less than I should. The diet carried on and the less fat I had, the harder it became to lose it. I spoke in my previous video about stubborn body fat and how if your body is holding on to stubborn body fat, you're probably better off respecting it because the human body is a wonderful thing and it wants to hold fat on you because it wants to keep you alive. I became obsessed with losing the last 10 pounds and it was those 10 pounds that were truly in the territory of stubborn body fat. This is when everything takes a really dark turn, firstly in terms of my behavior, but also a really dark turn, turn in terms of the way I felt about myself. I became obsessed, literally full on narcissistic levels of self-obsession and narcissistic levels of control over everything in my life. But of course, in this scenario, we're talking about losing weight. And when you're losing weight, the thing that you obviously need to do is reduce your food intake. By this point, when I hit that last bit of fat that I wanted off, my body was basically saying, do not lose any more weight. We cannot let you do that. I didn't give a fuck. I didn't give a flying fuck about what my body was saying. I was obsessed by this point. I'd invested so much time emotionally. I'd invested so much time into just deciding that I was gonna do this. I didn't want any obstruction. So by the end of it, I'd taken my calories so low, I was probably on about 1300 a day literally nothing and on top of that 1300 a day i was probably doing cardio six times a week for an hour sometimes twice a day so we are talking full-on full-on almost starvation mode at this point i cannot function physically i remember being at work and i remember looking at my monitor and i couldn't even concentrate everything was blurred my hand would shake when i was trying to move the mouse around I just couldn't concentrate. I couldn't even really move at points. I remember I'd be lying on my sofa at home and I would want to get up to go and change the channel on TV or go downstairs to get a drink. And I would physically at points have to will myself to get up because it was becoming such a physical struggle. I remember I'd come home and I'd get the train home from work and I would be sitting there and I would look around and I would be desperate for a seat because it was physically a struggle to keep myself on my feet for 10 minutes. I don't say that to talk about how hard it was I say that because I literally want to shake myself and just say, why didn't you have something to eat? And I think if, to, if I was to ask myself back then why I didn't do that, I don't think I'd have an answer. I'd made this correlation in my head. If I ate, I was going to be further away from my goal. And if I became further away from my goal, I wasn't good enough. And I wasn't good enough as a man. But despite being in that situation and despite being that hungry and that depleted of food, I still carried on working out no matter what. Look at this picture on screen again. How many times do you think I was working out a week then? How many times do you think I was lifting weights? Five, five times a week. You look at that picture and you wouldn't even think I've ever touched a weight, let alone have given that much commitment to it. And I think that that really just tells the story of just how hard I was being on myself. The other thing to say as well, from a physical perspective at this point in time too, I was always cold, literally freezing cold. So I can remember there'd be periods when it was British summertime, admittedly it was coming to the end, but it was still fairly hot. I'd be shivering. I would be sitting in my desk at work, wearing a shirt, a jacket, and sometimes a jumper in summer, and I would be shivering. And from a physiological perspective, this makes a lot of sense. When you're as skinny as I was in those pictures, your body literally thinks you are starving yourself to death. And it wants to do everything it can in order to keep you alive. And one of the things that it does to keep you alive it down regulates your body temperature because regulating and keeping your body temperature higher requires calories. And it doesn't think that it's gonna get any more calories from you because it thinks that you are starving yourself to death. The other really powerful thing to say at this point as well, 
A lot of people talk about how when they lose a lot of weight and they get really lean, their sex drive goes. I had no sex drive at this point. I was impotent. I couldn't get a boner and I couldn't even get my dick hard for a second. And that didn't matter what the scenario was. I had essentially destroyed my body's natural testosterone production. And again, this makes a lot of sense. When you lose a lot of weight, your body tries to stop every function it can in order to keep you alive because producing testosterone and using testosterone requires calorie burning. So again, it down regulates your testosterone and you literally bum out. You almost have the toss testosterone levels of a woman. And that was exactly what I had. And there's a particular moment that I can remember when I was on holiday with my ex-girlfriend. We went out for dinner and we came back and she dressed up, she'd put on some suspenders and she wanted to obviously have a really, really good night. I looked at her, I felt nothing. I literally felt nothing. My dick wouldn't get hard and absolutely nothing happened. I don't think she understood it and at the time I don't think I understood it. But I can honestly tell you now at that point my testosterone production had stopped. Funny thing to say at that point as well is I still couldn't see my abs. So what do you do in that situation? You get even more hardcore, you get even more focused. This is when the obsession took a slightly diverse and slightly, almost looking back, slightly laughable approach. I was using my fitness pal, which of course is the tracking app that people use to track everything that I eat. And I did it every single day for the 10 months that I was dieting, literally every single day without a break. But I thought that that wasn't enough control. I thought that I wasn't doing enough in order to know. So I started taking my weight on the scale every single day at exactly the same time. And I wanted it to be as accurate as possible. So I didn't just stop with taking my scale weight at exactly the same time. I would take a weekly average and then I would calculate what I weighed to the gram, literally to the gram, to the ounce, whatever currency you'd want to have. Then I had a spreadsheet at work where I used to track my weight every single day. So I would keep that consistently updated. And then the other thing that I would do as well is I would track everything that I'd eaten every single day the protein, the fat, the calories, everything. If I wasn't losing any more weight, I just would reduce it. And I'd adjust it, adjust it then on my spreadsheet so that my average body weight would go down and my average food intake would go down as well. If anybody tried to challenge me, if anybody tried to say, why are you doing that? I'd feel angry, I'd get entitled. I'd say, you don't understand what it is like to be discommitted. You don't understand what it is like to be a strong person who goes after what he wants fucking tragic when I look back at it that I actually felt that strongly like that. In addition to that too, I was really beginning to withdraw myself a lot from my friends. I would still see them, but I can remember we'd go around someone's house, they'd order takeaway, they'd get pizza, they'd get whatever nice food it would be. That wouldn't be good enough for me. So I would take a Tupperware box with just lettuce and cold chicken in it. They'd sit eating their pizza, I'd sit eating my lettuce and my cold chicken. I'd look at their pizza, I'd be desperate for it. I would crave it, it would look so good. But I wouldn't allow myself to have it, it was gonna take me further away from my goal. So I'd sit there, eating my lettuce, eating my chicken, feeling painfully unfulfilled. You'd think that I would snap out of that, you'd think that I'd think life's gotta have more meaning and life's gotta have more benefit than that. No, nope. I carried on, I kept going. If I didn't lose weight, I just would do, the, do more cardio. So again, I added my cardio to my spreadsheet at work. If I wasn't losing any more weight, I'd up the cardio. By the end of it, six, six cardio, six times a week, sometimes twice a day, relentlessly. And we're not talking 10 minutes on a treadmill, we're talking an hour on a treadmill. And this is where I think you really have to look at this as being very much anorexia. I would go, I'd set the incline on the treadmill to really high. I would walk, I'd set it so I could see the amount of calories that I was burning. And I would burn a minimum of 600 to 800 calories, a fair bit. And bear in mind at this point, I was eating around about 1100 calories a day. I was literally functioning off nothing. And there's another moment that I remember. I'd come home from work one evening and I needed to go to Tesco in order to do my weekly food shop. Tesco is a British supermarket for those of you in America watching. And I remember staring at myself in the mirror. I just wanted to make sure that I looked presentable before I went out. I remember my eyes began to go, my legs began to shake and then I fell. I smashed my head on my desktop PC at home. And I had a bruise there, and I had a bruise on my arm from when I fell there as well. I just felt weak, and I was literally getting weaker the more this went on. You think again, stop, eat more, you know, enjoy your life. This is obviously not working for you, this is obviously not right. What did I do? Got up, went to the food shop, came home, 
put on my gym gear, went to the gym and did my cardio. When I look back, this is such a destructive cycle. And when I look back, I was obviously a lot more miserable than I gave myself credit for. And what do you do when you physically can't stop any more food coming inside you? You try and get it out. You take these two little fingers and you put them at the back of your throat and you try and get food out that way. I did that a couple of times towards the end. And it was then that I realized that I had a real problem. In future videos, I wanna talk a lot more about recovery and I wanna talk a lot more about how my relationship with food, fitness and body image has massively improved. But for now, I wanna leave you with something that I really hope will resonate and prove powerful for you. First of all, don't pedestal, don't make idols and don't celebrate celebrities as being something incredible. They are just people that you see in the limelight. They are just people that you see promoted and pushed in a specific limelight. If you saw them in person, if you saw them on a day-to-day -day basis, they would be no more special than you or I am. And I think that we lose sight of that because we get constant exposure and constant media narratives about celebrities pushed our way. But I think more importantly, what I wanna say, no matter how bad you feel, no matter how bad you feel within yourself at your very, very worst moment, you have got so much more going for you than you possibly realize. And I would really encourage you to stop looking for the negative and just try and find one positive wherever you can, because I promise you it is absolutely there and it is absolutely something you'll be able to find. But as always, thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please can I ask you to click like and subscribe down below. If you really liked it, I am now offering one-on-one -on -one coaching at the website also down below. But as always, nothing but love. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you all in the next one.